Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see your faces. I'd love if you'd stand and worship with us as we get started this morning. He is to the one who made the morning bright. He is to the one who taught the stars to shine. He is to the one who graced the dead of night. Pull me from the dark, set my heart alight. Yeah! He is to the one who made my heart to sing. Open up my eyes, wash away my sin. He is to the one who gave his life for mine. Broke all my kings, set me free, all right to the way. He is to the way you wiped away my past He is to the future and the things to come He is to my Savior's everlasting love To the way, to the truth To the life I live in the light you give Jesus, He is to your name over everything kindness He is to your goodness He is to your freedom He is to the day I see you Jesus He is to your glory He is to your greatness He is to your kingdom He is to the name of Jesus to the way Now, I have to say, I think the 9 o'clock jumped a little bit better than you guys did here at 1045. So, hey, man, it's great that you guys are here, and uh, um, we're just excited to be here together uh, to worship, really, the King of Kings. And I know that some of you um, are coming into this place just, like, feeling burdened and maybe in the midst of a storm, and you're just wondering, like, oh, this is hard for me to do because I don't see God in the midst right now. And, and so I'm coming to find him. I'm coming to seek him, to be with other people. Um, I know I shared this this past summer. It's just um, that our family, my wife and I, and our four kids, um, we went through this storm over this last year um, where we were, you know, I had lost my job and, and we were unemployed for a long time. And um, there were times when we were in the midst of like fear and doubt and just wondering like, God, are you even with us? But we decided to choose to like worship the King of Kings because he's the one who is worthy to be praised. His name is the one that's worthy to be praised. And, and we said we're going to worship him even in the midst of that because we really believe that when we worship the King, he brings peace and, and overwhelming joy into the midst of our circumstances. And that doesn't mean that our circumstances necessarily change right, right at that time. Um, but he brings joy and peace in the midst of that. So when we sing, when we worship, 
you know, our hallelujah, when we raise a hallelujah, that means raising our highest praise to the king. We're saying, God, we're going to trust you even in the midst of this storm. When we can't see what you're doing, we will sing. We will sometimes sing louder. And we got a chance to do that with our family. And our kids would see us and be like, you guys, you know, dad, you're singing so loud. Or mom, you know, you guys are... You guys are just singing all the time. And it's like, yes, because we are, we're wanting God to invade our circumstance where we're at because he's worthy because of Jesus. And so we're going to sing that out. And I, I, and I can tell you this. He brings an overwhelming joy. He brings, he, he overwhelms us in the midst of those storms. Um, we got a chance to even just celebrate our, our daughter last night as um, she decided to be baptized. And... Um, just a great joy in her life because she's seen us walk through that there are trials in this world and she's been able to see that and she's still saying, I want to I want to proclaim you, Jesus, and I want the world to know. So I pray that that's where we're at. If we're there, let us raise our worship right now because King Jesus has already done it. He went to the cross for us and we're going to sing this out together. You guys ready? Let's raise the hallelujah together. Come on.
You guys can have a seat. Have you ever sat at a bus stop or on a park bench and noticed people on the go around you? The scene was buzzing with activity, right? People never stop, and neither does their creator. Sometimes we beg God to act as if he is still, but he is always moving, always at work. Not only do we get to celebrate his acts of love and redemption, but we actually get to join him in these good works. And there is nothing more life-giving than joining God as he moves. Here are some recent happenings at Kensington where we did just that. Just a few weeks ago, we gathered at Stony Creek Metro Park to celebrate over 200 people as they were baptized. Let me tell you, one of the most beautiful things you can witness in someone's life is that breathtaking moment when they break through the water surface, rising up to stand again, but this time with new life in Jesus. I feel like this is my time to recommit to God and to follow his path and to build a new family. And I'm more than happy to do that. And it's just a blessing to be here. Our own organization, Hope Water Project, exists to bring clean, life-giving water and the hope of Jesus to the parched communities of the Pocock. In June, Hope Water Project held its annual 5K and kids run, but this time it was at our own Troy campus, and we saw a lot of community involvement. From the residents of Emerald Lakes Village who cheered the runners on, to the families from Hamlin Elementary that came out for the kids run, to the Troy Police Department who worked tirelessly to redirect traffic, these 800 walkers and runners didn't sit still. They got up and moved, and because of it, two wells will be dug in Kenya, which will impact thousands. It isn't just running, we're running for what? A purpose! God cares about family, about all those struggles and victories at home, and he consistently moves in hearts at our annual Rock Your Family Retreat. This July, over 400 people took time away to reconnect as a family and to make Jesus the foundation of everything they're building. There are hundreds of Jesus stories, but here's one. One dad and his young stepson attended Rock Your Family after a challenging and stressful year for their family. For them, it was life-giving. They rested, they played, and they left closer to one another and to the heart of Jesus. Maybe you already know about Kaleo Kids and how the arts are being brought to elementary children in our local partner schools but you may not realize just how powerfully God is using this program to build confidence and intentional friendships. Kaleo Spark Camp, a day camp held at Orient Campus in August, gave our kids an outlet to use their talents to dance and sing about God's great love for us. At Kensington, we embrace diversity, including our community of friends with special needs. A few weeks ago, we held an epic party, a hoedown in fact, and the joy that lit up the faces of our guests was contagious. Personally, I have so many friends in this community, and for me to be on stage tonight and have all Andre and Chris and both Marks and everyone around us dancing, uh, boy, I'll tell you, man, it just absolutely blew my heart wide open. Twice a year, we come together to be refreshed, inspired, and mobilized in our leading and serving. Our most recent leadership gathering was on August 28th at Troy Campus. We heard from Steve Andrews and Danny Cox on the topic of unity, and we experienced incredible music from our worship team. God moved through all of it, and we left energized to continue on this mission to share Jesus. A community of, of believers who are all uh, bind at one. Uh, we're not perfect, but we're all in it together. I never really thought about how much change can actually take place if people are united together and loving each other while, while doing that. I have now had half a lifetime to watch these Jesus stories unfold. I reflect back on the beginning when we wondered if Jesus would ever do something with us at all. And he has answered that hope with an avalanche of blessing and purpose. Today we shared a handful of stories from recent months and they represent just a, a fraction of the thousands of stories of life change happening all around us. And honestly, I wish I could tell you all of them. But here's what I want you to know. 
When we focus on the one that God's brought to us, he allows us together to reach thousands. And with Jesus, not one person is overlooked. It's humbling to be a part of this church, this community of people on mission. And I keep shaking my head in surprise that he has allowed us to join him as he resurrects lives, rebuilds communities, and redeems stories. And it's all because of people. People simply making themselves available to Jesus and taking a step of faith. And it's certainly not because we've done it all right. He delights to work through us despite our many weaknesses and fumbles. One of the verses we've always loved is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Every time I read that or say it, I realize how outrageous it really is. This is what Jesus promises? Yes, and he keeps doing it. And most often, he takes our greatest weakness as the starting point for his work in us. So as we look forward to this new season of ministry, let me ask you, what's your next step? Is it time to commit to showing up? Or if you've been doing that for a while now, maybe it's time to get connected by jumping into a group, a course, or a care initiative. Maybe God's been nudging you to move out and bring his love to a person or a place in desperate need of hope. I speak for our whole team that our greatest longing for you is to fully experience Jesus working through you, to move with him, to join in what he's doing, to lock arms with us. And when we connect together, we become so much more than we were before. So let's open ourselves to Jesus. Let's open those deep places to him where we hold tight to our hesitations and fears. Through Jesus, we really are able, we're able to add these incredible thousands of stories of life change. And this is your invitation to join us on this mission to reach the one. Yeah, you can give that a hand. Some of you were here two weeks ago. We showed that, and we just uh, show it every couple weeks. We're done showing it for right now. But I don't know if you know what we call that video. We call it our blank video. Anybody know? It's called the move video. You probably saw that or heard that word through there. We call it a move video because when we started Kensington almost 30 years ago, we had a dream. And the dream wasn't just that we'd become a community of people that would huddle and sing songs and uh, teach the Word of God. We wanted to be a church that did stuff, that moved. Like when we left here, we go impact wherever God sent us. We call it, we hope that God would transform everyone and mobilize everyone by Jesus, Jesus would do that. And so everything we do here is about that. God changing our lives in such a way that we know what we're put on this planet to do. We call it mobilization or mission or move. And I tell you what, I grew up going to church with my mom, uh, multiple different denominations, and I rarely saw the church doing stuff. I saw them gather. I didn't see them do anything when they scattered. And so move videos are a chance for you, especially if you're brand new here. We use those uh, or show those so you go, this is the DNA of this place that you're sitting in right now. It isn't a church just that we gather, but we actually have thousands of people of our campuses that are doing stuff like that in the community. In fact, here's a crazy thought. Today at 4.30, the middle school age kids will be here, and they're going to jump on a bus, go down to our Troy campus, and they're going to squirt uh, water and die at each other. We call it soak or die, not D-I-E, but D-Y-E. And it's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to be covered with purple and red and all kinds of stuff. And they're going to have to get all that washed out when they get home. Why do we do that? You might think we just want to have fun. We do want to have fun. And one of the DNAs of Kensington is fun as well. But the bigger idea is what? We're hoping that God gets a hold of these middle school age kids' hearts and they go on a journey where they see Jesus transform them and mobilize them, and they'll be moving even as uh, middle school and then high school and college and on beyond to make a difference in the world. All of that, everything you hear about here, has that sort of mission behind it. So if you're brand new, I mean like today or in the last month, we have a place for you in the lobby after the service called The Hub, and that means all things Kensington. You got, got questions, you want to find out what your next step is, meet us at The Hub, and we'll take you to that, that, that place as well. 
All right, so one of the things we're doing today is we're wrapping up a three-week series on community, the value of relationships. So before I jump into that, I'm going to have you do a little community, which means stand up, give somebody a high five, to, uh, ask them how sad they are that Michigan got destroyed yesterday, <laughs> and move toward the middle. <laughs> All right, so there were a lot of people yesterday in community sharing the same thing, grief over that Michigan game. Wow. Wow. Hopefully today will be a little better. The Lions will pick you up when they go to Philly. And Yeah, good luck with that, huh? Uh, well, here's the thing. As many of you know, this is week three, which is the final week of the Color of Dishes, which has been a series about the value community. In fact, we sort of, uh, the big idea is that a relational God, God in three, the triune God, I said this last week, a relational God has created us for relationships. That's how we actually do best in our life. Every time I talk about this topic, I always remember this study I saw years ago. Some of you have heard these stats before, but an actual medical study was done, there's been many of these, but uh, several years ago, and John Orberg, an author and pastor, wrote about it in a book that uh, he did on community, but it was a Harvard study. Listen to this, it's pretty amazing. They're just saying that you and I were made by God actually to be better in life when we're in community. And again, I'm not talking about being married, I'm talking about community with other friends, uh, neighbors, people that you do life with. God has made us to do better with people than isolated, right? And so, even physically, it's proven that we do better that way. A Harvard study back in the 70s did a study of this. It said they studied people that had bad health habits, and they clarified it by saying these people smoked, poor eating habits, obesity, alcohol use. It said people with bad health habits, I'm quoting here, but with strong relationships lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits but were isolated. Now, think about that just there. In fact, John Orberg makes a comment. He says, so that means it's better to eat Twinkies with good friends than to eat broccoli alone, <laughs> which is sort of a summary of the whole study. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. It's actually, you know, you're going to live longer if you eat bad, but you're in good relationships. Now, I'm not saying to eat bad. Think about if you did both. That's the way to live, right? Here's another one. Um, a study that was done where the General of American Medical Association uh, took 276 people who volunteered for the study, and they infected them with the virus that produces the common cold, and they wanted to see how they fight disease. Said the study found that those with strong relationships did four times better fighting off illness than those who were more isolated. I'm quoting here. It says, these people were less susceptible to colds, had less virus, and produced less mucus than isolated subjects. And Orberg says, I'm not making this up. They actually produce less mucus. This means it's literally true. Unfriendly people are snottier than friendly people. <laughs> but I mean, you hear these things, you're like, you're crazy. I don't know, some of you remember, uh, I think it was in the 80s, Robert Putman, uh, Putnam released a, a classic work called Bowling Alone. And it was a study of bowling and where, you know, how this, and basically a study on community. And I'm not kidding. Based on his research, he said this. He's a Harvard researcher. He says that if you belong to no groups, like I'm talking smaller groups, not just a big group like we're in right now, but a smaller group. If you belong to no groups, but this, decide to join one, you cut your risk of dying over the next year in half. Just by that step in the community. Now, you know what we're doing in this series. Last week, the week before, and now this week, we are encouraging you to what? Step into community. You think we're doing that because we just want to be able to report, hey, we got this many people in small groups? No. That is not the purpose. The purpose is to help you and me grow in our walk with God. That is the purpose. Why does that, how does that work? Well, if you do this, and this is all you do for your spiritual walk, your spiritual walk will not go very far. And you know what that means? That means it doesn't matter what I do here. <laughs> I don't care if I give a 10 sermon or if you get in your car. I know you all do this. What was Wilson today? A 3, 3.2? You know, I know we do this. We just critique how it goes. It doesn't matter if I give a 10 every week. If this is the only thing you do and you never connect in a smaller environment, 
you're not doing what God's called you to do, you'll never really, you'll plateau in your spiritual walk. And here's what you'll probably do. Here's what most people do. The church isn't meeting my needs. I'm telling you something right now. I'm telling you right now. If you only make this the only spiritual input you get every week and you never step into a small group, good luck. But if you step in a small group, I know this. I've been doing this for 40 years in my own life. I live this out weekly. Your spiritual walk, there's no limit to where it's going to go because that's how God does it. We say all the time, all I need is Jesus. Not true. I know it sounds like blasphemy for me to say this. You need Jesus and people. It's the way he made you. I mean, honestly, it is true. You only need Jesus. But the way he created the human soul is we need Jesus, but we need Jesus through people. And if you try to do it without people, good luck, right? I told you years ago, I bought a motorcycle and I thought it'd be really cool to ride. I found out it's no fun to ride by yourself. It's no fun. Hey, honey, you want to go? No, I don't want to go. Okay. There's nobody there. Motorcycles, you ride with people. I have a squad of guys I ride motorcycles with, and it's perfect for guys. Think about it. It's the perfect guy thing, right? Because you never talk. <laughs> you pull up to a stoplight, you look at each other. Hey, man, nice bike. Yeah, you too. <laughs> you talk like four words in a three-hour ride. It's perfect. But you're with people. I'm kidding. I went with, riding with a guy last night. We had dinner together. We talked about our lives, and that's how God grows me and him, and it's how God grows you. So here's all we're going to do today. As we wrap this thing up, let me remind you where we've been. And I want to see if anybody's been listening, okay? So I'm going to give you a little slogan, and you tell me what it means. First week, Cody actually, my son said this, five in five. Don't put it up. Don't put it up. They're in the back room right now. I don't want to put it up yet. I want to see if you know what five and five means. What's five and five mean? Show me your five friends. I'll show you where you'll be in five years. You can put up that first one now. And, and we talked about a yoke. Remember, Cody and I had this yoke on. It was his message, but he got me on stage, and he pulled me around in this yoke. And the, and the whole idea was Jesus said, you know, to be yoked with people because where they go, you're going. Truly, it's truly true. You show me your five friends, that's who you will be in five years. So let me ask you, you hanging with the right people? And I know, here's what you did. All your parents just said, I got to talk to my teenager. And maybe you do, but I want to talk to you. Who are you hanging with? Because who you're hanging with is who you will be. And we need to make decisions about what kind of influences we have in our life. That was week one. Week two was about taking off something. What was it? Not our clothes. Taking off the mask. I basically said this last week. I, 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 it, it's a phrase. To heal, you got to be real. To heal, you got to be real. If you're never uh, honest and authentic and share your secrets with somebody, and again, that's not with everybody, but somebody you're doing life with, a close friend for a guy, a close woman for another woman, then once that's out, you recognize, reveal your brokenness to point to the power of God. You see the power of God in a way you've never seen it before. That was week two. Today, it's just this simple. It's time to find your people. That's what today's all about. And I know, I put this up this way. I've heard that the, you don't say people anymore, you say squad. Am I right? Oh, you young folks. Is it squad now? Am I right or am I almost dated? Is that even gone? What do you call it now? Time to find your what? Your folks, your crowd, your people, your peeps. Boy, brothers, yeah. I mean, that's little girls, like teenage girls in the front row this morning, like squad. Okay, okay, whatever you want. It's time to find your squad. Here's what I mean. We've talked about it for two weeks. Today's the day to do it. If you haven't stepped in to find out who are, here's, here's a word for you. Who are going to be your pallbearers? Have you never thought of that before? A buddy of mine, Tim Kimmel, wrote a book back in the 70s that sold millions called Little House on the Freeway based on Little House of uh, the Prayer, right? And in that book, his first time I ever heard that phrase, Tim said, I better know the men that I'm pouring my life into because they're my pallbearers. Let me ask you right now. Do you know who's going to carry your casket? And if you don't, you better start grooming them right now. Not saying you're going to die, but you better know, guys, who they are, women, who they are. You better know. Because what's really interesting, if you ever even do a study, let me talk to the men. We got man up in three weeks, October 11th through 13th. It's a chance for men to come together at a retreat and meet some other guys to do life with. That's what happens every time people come out of there and they're like, I got a friend now. Here's what's really interesting about men in America. I don't know about other countries. I've only seen the studies of men in America. The average man in America today the average, actually, it's more than average. Nine out of 10 men in America say they don't have one true friend. And when you dive into that a little bit, you find out a lot of those guys said, yeah, I had buddies when I was a boy and in middle school and high school and maybe even college. I don't anymore. I have acquaintances. I have job guys. I don't really have a true friend. That is not how God wants men to live. Now, I don't know about women. 
Based on what I observe, women have a lot of friends. They just talk all the time. I'm kidding. I'm sure women struggle as well, but they seem to do better than men. And I'm telling you guys, man up is a chance for you to find a friend and do life with. Because I'm telling you, if you want to see God change your life, it starts with finding your squad. And let me tell you something. And I am not bragging. I'm just saying this is so important to me. I can give you the names right now of the guys that will carry my casket. We've been doing life together 30 years now. Raised our kids together. Did their weddings, their kids' weddings. I know their names. They know my name. Do you have names? You need to have them. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you four visuals. Like, how do I do this? How do I find my squad? How do I, you know, take steps in my life to get this? And some of you are do, already doing this. And so I'm going to say to you, what you're doing, pass on to others. But others of you, this is the day you say, today's the day. You walk into that lobby and you say, no more living isolated. No more living sort of, I need to find my squad. How do I do that? We've got a way for you to do that in the lobby. And so what I thought of is, man, you, you go back to the first church, the early church, back in the book of Acts, and you discover what did it look like then? It was sort of a, a model for what community could look like. And I know it's a different day and a different time, and they met more in homes than they did in buildings, but they actually congregated regularly, and there's a picture of what it looks like. Now, by the way, if you don't know the New Testament, you're going to know it. In three weeks, we're doing a, uh, actually, next week, we're starting a series on the Bible, and the third week, we're going to do an overview of the New Testament. But it to be a quick one. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're eyewitness gospel accounts of the life of Jesus. He dies. He raises from the dead. He ascends to his father, and then the church has started in the book of Acts, called the Acts of the Apostles, or more specifically, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, and the church starts. The church means community, ecclesia. It means small community that can grow, and there's a, a description in Acts chapter 2 of the early church. Now, listen real closely. I'm going to walk you through some of these, but this is a picture of how community looks. In ver verse 42, chapter 2, it said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's a beautiful picture of what the early community looked like that we now actually represent, okay? So if you're gonna do life and find your squad, what do you need? Here's the first visual. And I found it right there in verse 46. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Here's what that means. They decided to put meeting together on what? Their calendar. So here's your first visual. Now this isn't the calendar we actually use in our home. We use this calendar. It's digital. Anybody with me, right? You got invites and all those kind of things. So, but my wife says, you know, we're traveling and we're doing these different things. I need a calendar that just has our travel schedule on it. So there's September. We were gone doing radio that week. She's in Georgia this week. I mean, there's different things. So that, that's it. But here's all it is. It doesn't matter what your calendar looks like. Here's what a calendar represents. A calendar represents intentional time, right? Am I right? Whatever gets on your calendar is what's important to you. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, we've said this all the time, but if, if it's not on here, it's, it, it may, we may say it's important, but it's really not important. But if it's on here, it means it matters. We said this many times here. You've heard me say this, and I know this is true. If you want to know what's important to a person, where do you look? Their calendar and their bank account. Checkbook. I don't know if anybody knows what those are anymore. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Money, time. So here's the thing. You can say Grooming my pallbearers, finding my squad is important. If it's not on the calendar, it's not important. Or if it's on the calendar, what I would call written in pencil, which means it's important, but if something better comes along, right? Like I'm going to meet my, my small group on Tuesday nights, but if I get an invite to play Oakland Hills at 5 p.m., I'm playing Oakland okay. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I am asking for one. Anyway, here's the deal. I mean, you get an invite like that, it's like, whoa, okay, right? But here's the thing. Intentional time is what they did. They met together in the temple courts. You think they just fell into that? No, 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 no. I guarantee you, because you watch the growth of the church. This is something they said to each other. Okay, tomorrow at five, meet. It was on their calendar. They didn't have a paper one like this, but they had one, and it was intentional. You put it in pen. Nothing else 
gets on there and nothing bumps it out. I used to say, you guys have read our book, you know the story of vertical marriage, but here's the thing. I used to say to Ann, you are the most important woman in my life and I am gonna schedule time with you every week. It's called a date, but I didn't do it. It was nothing but words. Actually, I did write it down. And then a speaking engagement would come in with an honorarium, and we had no money at the time. So I said, hey, honey, we'll just bump our date night to Saturday night. I'm going to take this. And feeling like I'm doing the right thing for her and the family because I'm going to go make some money to pay the bills. But what happened then Saturday night, something came. And then Sunday night, next thing you know, you went a week. Then you went two weeks. Then you went three weeks. Guess what happens to a marriage that doesn't spend intentional time together? It's in trouble. You got little kids? I'm trying to teach my young son, Cody, this right now. I mean it. You need to get a sitter, dude. You need to get her out of the house, away from Bryce, and do this. Now, you don't understand, Dad. I think I do. <laughs> I think we've done this. No, you don't understand. I do. We are your sitter, by the way. We would love go. And we've gone over there many times Say, get out. Go. You got to go. Friday, we said, go play golf. Do whatever you want. We got Bryce. And we love it. But it's that intentional time. Same thing is true about your spiritual walk. If you're never putting it on the calendar, it'll never happen. And when you do put it on the calendar, your life starts to change. You know, I, 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 I copied down a quote for you that I want you to read. This is really interesting. Alan McGinnis, a psychologist, talks about this. He says, people rarely drift into deep community. You don't drift into this. It doesn't just happen. It has to be on your calendar. It has to be intentional. It's got to be scheduled, right? He says people don't drift into uh, deep community. Psychologist Alan McGinnis notes that, the, that rule number one for entering into deep relationships sounds deceptively simple. Assign top priority to your relationships. Ironically, look at this. We tend to devote massive amounts of time to making money, running errands, succeeding at our jobs. Could I add this? Youth sports. Oh, sorry, didn't want to dig too deep. But we neglect giving our most valuable possession, time, to the experience for which we are created, community. You can't do community fast. You've got to decide, I'm going to put it on the calendar, and I'm going to get there. You know, I was thinking uh, about my, uh, for 33 years, I was a Detroit Lions chaplain, and that meant Ann and I both had things going on for the team during the week and during the, during the season. And so think about this. It was much like a church week schedule. We had a Saturday night, what we call chapel service, in the hotel, at home or on the road. So they did that last night in Philly. And then, that, so that was sort of like coming to church. A lot of guys come to that, right? Coaches. And then during the week, we would have a, a Monday night couple study. That was available to any of the players and their wives, girlfriends. And then we'd have a Thursday uh, study that Ann did with all the women and girlfriends. And then Friday, I'd have a guy study. And then we'd cycle that out, and there's all kinds of stuff. Now, think about this. I noticed this over 33 years. The guys that only came to chapel, and that was it, plateaued in their spiritual walk. What are, what are they doing? They're only coming to church, big church. They never came Monday. They never came Friday. They had other things more important. They didn't show up. The guys that showed up on Monday night, and on Friday, and by the way, we're talking a couple hours a week, grew. And they invited others, and they found community. And they still have community even now after out of their league. They found it, not in the church service. They found it in the Bible study. Think about that. So let me ask you, are you only coming to chapel? That's good. I'm glad you're here. But if you don't take the next step to a small group, which is waiting for you in the lobby today, here's all I can say to you. Good luck. Hope you grow. I'll pray for you. You know what I'll pray? I'll pray you get in community. That's what I'll pray. <laughs> I'll be honest. That's what I'll pray because I know what happens when you put it on your calendar. I'm going to do the first time ever in my life. I'm scared to death to do it. I'm going to get in a small group. This is the year. 2019 is the year. I'm going to find out who Jesus is. I'm going to go to Alpha, and I'm going to make this thing happen. Whatever it looks like, when you make it intentional and it gets on that calendar, things start to happen. But that's only one aspect of it. You go back to the passage and you find this. It says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So they didn't just have Bible study together and, and listen to the apostles' teaching. They also did, here's the second visual. They ate together. I got a fork. I don't know what kind of fork this is. My wife picks all that stuff out and I guess it's really important, but there it is. It's stainless steel, I guess, and it's really pretty. So there you go. And I'm going to return it because I'll get in trouble if I don't bring this back home to my house. But I didn't want to do a plastic one. I want to do a real one because the second area is first you got intentional time. It's on your calendar. But then you got 
meal time or hang time. Just the first one's organized time, right? You put it on your calendar. The second one is just hang out. What do you do when you hang out? You have something to eat. What were they doing? Breaking bread in one another's homes. Guess what that meant? They knew the color of each other's dishes. Why? Because they're, again, there's a part of intentionality. Hey, come over to my house Friday night at six. That's on the counter. Other times it's just show up, right? And I'm telling you, when you hang out with people in an organic time, you go places you don't go with other people and you start hanging out with similar people over periods of time, life change. You go back to this Alice Mc, Alan McGinnis quote. He said this, the requirement for true intimacy, look at this, is chunks of unhurried time. Now, even as I read that, I think, man, we live in a community that doesn't have unhurried time. Everything's hurried because we've got the next thing. He says, chunks of unhurried time. If you think you can fit deep community into the cracks of an overloaded schedule, think again. Wise people do not try to microwave friendship, parenting, or marriage. You can't do community in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't mourn in a hurry with those who mourn or rejoice in a hurry with those who rejoice. Many people lack great friends for the simple reason that they have never made pursuing community a high priority. So it's this simple. It, it, it could be on your calendar. It could be just more organic. You just show up and hang out and you have a meal together. That's why I texted Don yesterday and said, dude, you want to ride and grab something to eat? Boom. Was that on the calendar? Nope. Spur of the moment, a guy I want to do life with, he's doing life with me. Let's go hang out. Wives can't go. It's just going to be us two guys going to Bad Brad's last night and grabbing some barbecue. And that's all we did. What happens? Hang over a meal. I actually believe this. You know why God gave us food? To slow us down so we do community over meals. You can eat alone. I get it. But God wants you to eat with people. Well, we had a, a kid live with us for a, a couple of weeks, 15 some years ago. Our kids were in high school at the time and he was a teenager as well. And at the end of the week, we're sitting down having a meal with our whole family. And at our meals, this is how it worked in our home. My wife wants to talk at the dinner table. Not just talk, talk. And she's asking the boys questions and always, you know, digging around, let's go somewhere. And we had no phones allowed, no cell phones. There was, back in the day when recorded phones, could not answer the phone. Meal time is hang time. We're gonna be intentional about let's, let's talk. And so, and I wouldn't have done that. I, what a gift my wife is to say, we're gonna go there. And this was all boys around her. So she asked this teenage boy, hey, you been with us a week. What have you learned about the Wilsons? And I'll never forget, he goes, Wow, you know, that's an easy one. He goes, I've never seen this in my home. We're like, oh no, whoa, what's this? <laughs> he goes, he looks at me, he goes, Dave, you got guys that just show up here, unannounced. I saw that happen regularly. Like, Rob would come over, or John would come over, you guys go out, start shooting hoops, and you'd be talking, and they have a meal, and they sit down, you watch. So that happens all the time. That never happens in my home. He goes, it was really beautiful to see men connecting with other men. And I thought, that's a good thing for him to see. That is organized organic. <laughs> it's on purpose, but it's creative and free-flowing. And I'm telling you, do it. And the way to do it is always have food available. You have food, people show up. I said this, we're writing a, 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 a parenting book right now. We're working on the draft for Zondervan. And in that, we, we have a, a whole thing about food. <laughs> if you have teenagers, you need to stay up late and you need food always there. Am I right? Yeah, because if you have food on the island and your sons or daughters come home at midnight and you want to go to bed, don't go to bed. Have the food there. Everybody will come to your house and they'll eat your food. Yes, you have to spend money. And my wife knew this was genius. Like they're going to come to our house and they're going to hang out and we're going to stand around the island and we're going to eat and we're going to get to know them. And I'm like, I don't want to spend that money. She goes, we're spending the money because the window's short and it's going to be gone. And here I am now. They're gone. There's nobody in my house now but Ann, me, and Duke, the golden retriever. That's it. So when that window was there, there was food there. Why did God give us food? So we'd stop, we'd eat, break bread together, and we communicate. That's where relationships are built. So I'm telling you, you need intentional time, a calendar. You need organic time. And then here's the thing. You notice, you go back to verse 47. It says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what happened when they got together? At some point when they got together, they went vertical. It wasn't, let's talk about Michigan football all day. Who wants to talk about that? Or the Lions. 
Those are wonderful things to talk about, but you can't spend all your time just talking about stuff that doesn't mean anything. At some point, here's the third visual, you got to go vertical. I don't know if you guys know what this is. This is a Bible. It's actually got paper and words. We're going to, like I said, do a series starting next week on this. I'm kidding. Most of us have our Bibles right here digitally. I don't care if you do a digital or with a real one, but at some point, do more than just horizontal. Do more than horizontal. And horizontal is important. You get to know each other, you hang out, you laugh, you have a good time, you watch a game, whatever. But at some point, bring some intensity to say, let's talk about what God has to say about this. I'll tell you something. I remember my first ever Bible study in college. I was scared to death. Some of you have heard this story. I hid my Bible under my, my uh, Ball State letter jacket. I'm walking across campus on a Friday night. I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing? Friday night is party night. I was the guy at the parties. Now I'm like a Christian. I'm going to Bible study. This is going to be the most boring thing. I was scared to death. I didn't want anybody to know. I'm walking across campus. I'm scared. I'm thinking, oh, they're going to do with these Bible studies. I know what they do. They sing Kumbaya and they handle snakes. I didn't know what was going to happen, you know? So I was scared. I sat in there. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget the day that we talked. We hung out. We laughed a little bit. And then all of a sudden the leader goes, hey, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. I didn't know where the Gospel of John was. I was really embarrassed. I just did this. I'm like, hmm. You know, I'm looking like, are they going to the back or the front? I didn't know. And fortunately, the, the, the leader said, hey, it's on page 1,136. Thank you. And then he started to teach John chapter 3. I'm sure I'd heard it in church. I don't remember. All I know is when I was walking back to my dorm room, I was thinking, that's the word of God? I just got to hear from God? This is life-changing. When you open the word in a small group setting, it's different than right here. This is great. I hope you feel like God speaks to you through a big group. But when it's in a smaller group where you can open up and then you go, hey, can I ask you something about that? How do you apply that? What's it look like? I cannot, but every one of you is shaking your head going, yep, been there, been in a small group. I've experienced that. When you go vertical, and the Bible just represents this, Put it on your calendar, intentional, hang out, but at some point, and maybe it's you, let's go vertical. Let's invite God into this conversation and say, what do you think God has to say about it? It, it, It's it's right here in the Bible. And by the way, I said, you know, next week, I'm I'm so excited. I wrote this series. I'm really excited about this. We're going to start a series on this book, because here's what I believe. Many of us are intimidated by this thing. We're scared of it. We don't even know what's really in there. It's like, there's so many books. Why are there 66, and yet it's one We're going to explain that. I'll give you a five-week overview. You ready? Here's the series you're going to come to, and I hope you bring somebody. Next week, what's the purpose of the Bible? We call it Why Bible. What's the purpose? You're going to be surprised to find out why this text is in our hands. Number two, and this is going to be crazy to do this. I call it second week, the Old Testament in 39 minutes. It's going to be impossible, but I'm going to cover 39 books in 39 minutes. All right? There's 39 books in the Old Testament. We're going to give you an overview, so the next time you pick up the Old Testament, you go, I think I understand the history. I don't know it all, but I have a, an overview, so I'm not lost when I'm in Habakkuk or in Hosea or in these weird Amos, you know, Malachi or Malachi, if you're Italian prophets, right? Okay, so that's thing. Then the next week is the New Testament in 27. There's 27 books. We're going to go through it in 30 minutes, 27 minutes, right? And then the, the fourth week is this one. How do you interpret Scripture accurately? There's a lot of bad interpretations of verses. You've heard them all, right? It means this. No, it doesn't. Who in the world came up with that? You got to know how to interpret this correctly. And then the fifth week is going to be a week of stories of people's lives being changed by the word of God. There you go. Five weeks. It's going to be a powerful series. And I hope by the end of the thing, you're like, man, this book's amazing. And I actually feel comfortable in it now. But the Bible needs to be a part of your life. And then here's the last one. So say it with me. We've got the calendar. We've got the fork. We've got... The Bible, last one, car keys. Here you go, man. Those are my car keys. What's that mean? Here's what it means. It means all the believers were together and had everything in common. What's that mean? They shared their lives. They shared their car keys with each other. You need a car? You're in trouble here? Here's my car. By the way, that's my motorcycle. Ain't happening. All right? I said, I said car keys. Not my, not my Harley. Not going to have it sitting right out there. Uh, you can't drive that. But I'll give you my car. I'm kidding. It's, it's, it's you doing life together. And so the early church was a beautiful picture. If somebody had more and somebody had less, they shared. And so here's the thing. Who in your life are you so close with that if the power went out tonight, and that's happened recently, you wouldn't even have to blink 
If they heard about it, they'd call you and say, dude, stay at my house. I'm not there. You know the code. It's yours. The whole house is yours. The car is yours. Anything you need is yours. And you're doing the same thing for them. That's the color of dishes. Do you have somebody in your life like that? I hope so. I've got several. And they've spent time at my house. I've spent time at their house. We've known the color of dishes dishes for 30 years. One of them, John Borgen. You've seen John up here a few times. He's my truck guy. He's got a pickup truck. You need a guy with a pickup. You got to be in your life. Just... Pretend you like them just to have that guy in your life. I'm kidding. But John's got a pickup, and so anytime I need a pickup, I mean, and I'm not kidding. I've never once texted him and said, John, can I borrow? Yep, of course. Alex is in here somewhere. His son's got a pickup. I borrowed Alex's pickup. Anytime you want it, it's yours. I remember when Cody got married. He's on his honeymoon. Uh, some of you remember this. Uh, we had to move a, a mattress into his uh, house that he was going to move into when he got back. And so we said, we'll have it set up for you. We'll have that. We had moved everything else. So we had to get this queen-size mattress or whatever. One of the Lions players gave it to me. He was on the team at the time. So, uh, so I called John, can I buy your truck? It's just about to rain. So I got it. I got this mattress on the back. And Ann's like, don't we need to strap this down better? I'm like, no, we got to go. It's going to rain. We can't get caught in the rain. Let's go. It's not going to blow off. I won't go fast. We get on I-75. You know, I tell you, the worst feeling in the world is when you look in the rear view mirror and you see it go... It flies off the back and lands on the left lane on I-75 right over by Square Lake. And there's traffic. And I'm like, oh, no. So we're over on the shoulder. And I'm not kidding. We, we run out, push it into the other shoulder, get out. Nobody hit it. Somehow we get it on this thing. Starts downpour. So we go under, sit under this overpass. It never stops. We drive it to a friend's, put it in there, put fans on it. And we both looked at each other and said, we'll never tell Cody. <laughs> never. He's a perfectionist. If he knew this, he'd lay on and go, what's wrong with this mattress? If he knew, but if he doesn't know, he probably wouldn't know. So we never told him. We got it dried out. We put it in it the next day. It's all perfect. They come home from the honeymoon. We waited a month. Hey, how's your bed? Oh, it's great, man. That bed is great. Well, let me tell you a story. He's like, what? He didn't care anymore. It's all scuffed up. He's never even seen it, right? But that was John giving us his truck because we share life. And I've got other guys, and you have other people in your life as well. That's the question. Who are you doing life with? Is it on your calendar? Are you doing meals and hang time together? Are you going vertical together? It will literally change your life. And then are you so close that everything is shared? And I thought of one last one before, the, uh, before I closed out the last service. And I thought, here, this is something really important as well. And you know I got to... I got to bring a football. It's football season, right? So I didn't even bring a football down here today. I just found this in the kid's wing. And I thought, here's the last thing I want you to visualize as well. It isn't just like God gives you Jesus. You're supposed to what? Give it away. You don't hold on to it. The whole purpose is as God makes you a disciple, you're called to make disciples of other people. So it isn't just hold on to it. Somebody stand up. I got to throw this to somebody just for a visual. Okay? So what do you do? You throw it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Now, you got to catch it when I throw it. Okay. <laughs> Try and throw it back, John Paul. Think you can do it? Oh, boy. Look out, look out, look out, look out. <laughs> right, I need somebody way back there. Somebody stand up. I need you back by the wall. All right? We're going to have some fun. Get back to the wall. Get back to the wall. I'm not throwing it in the middle of a crowd. Is that Mike? Yeah, okay. Mike will catch this. I used to pass him a basketball. So here's the deal. God gives you something. I know we're being a little crazy right now. But it's football season. He wants you to, you ready? <clears throat> to give it away. Woo! Hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. no. So, so here's the deal. Now think about the Christian faith. Mike, Mike can answer this. If I pass on what Jesus has given me to Mike, Mike, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. I don't even know what he's going to say, but I knew he'd know the answer. He doesn't give it back to me, although there is that interplay back and forth between a mentor and a disciple. But then as a disciple, you pass it on. That's the goal. That's how the church is built. Now, let me tell you something. Mike, I'll get that later. You can sit down. (laughs) Here's the question. Do you want to be a part of that or not? Or do you want to just do the Christian life like you've done it? Mediocre, lukewarm, same old, same old. And I mean this. Or are you ready to play the real game? Is it time to stop playing church? And stink and say, I'm going to find my squad. And if you're mature in Christ, it's like, I'm going to lead this squad. And I'm going to do something with my life that matters. Because all the other stuff just doesn't really matter. And I'm not saying sports don't matter, football don't matter. 
But I am saying it doesn't matter unless there's a bigger goal in it. I'm thinking all this, this last two weeks. You know what I was thinking? I didn't, I didn't say it was first service. Here's what hit me. You know what Antonio Brown needs? Seriously, I know Antonio. Cody played with him his freshman year. I met him when Cody was getting recruited. He was one of the first players I met at Central when Cody was being recruited to go up there. And I'm like, dude, this guy's a player. You guys are going to, and they were top 25 that first year when I, Antonio was a junior. And Cody told you a couple weeks ago he roomed with him. So I know Antonio. And if he called me up and said, Dave, what do I need? I'd say, you need men in your life who will tell you the truth. Because you don't have them. You've risen to a level where nobody's able to speak life, and it's probably because you won't let them, but you need a guy in your life who'll look in your eye and say, dude, you're full of it. And you need that, and I need that, and women need that, and if you don't have that, you're never gonna get to where God wants you to be. And I'm telling you, you think it's just a bunch of little tables out there. Oh, it's not, no, 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 this is life-changing. You go out there today and you say, okay, I'm gonna get serious about this. Where do I connect? There's a place for you. We've created it. I guarantee there's a place. And if it doesn't work, try another one. They don't always work the first time. Try another one. You're going to find your Paul Bears. I promise you, God has the men and the women and the couples that you need to do life with, and they will change your life. So I want to show you a video. Michael Bouchard, our student minister director. Some of you have seen this video five, six years ago where he decided, I'm not just keeping my faith to myself. I'm going to take it to this trailer park right here right there. And it's amazing what God did through Michael to impact others as he took what God had given him and he passed it along and literally changed an entire area. And it's still rippling to this day. We're going to receive our offering as you watch this. And I just want to say thank you. So many of you, thousands of you give. Most of you do it this way. You just do it digitally. It's safe. And if you're new here and you're like, man, I want my money to match my commitment. I want to start giving. That's how you do it. It's that simple, and I say thank you before you even start. Join us. It's a mission worth your life, and uh, this is the mission. You're going to see a, just a snippet of how God works through just one of our people to impact the world. Watch this. I think it seems bigger than what it is. It seems harder than what it is. Really, mentoring happens in the small stuff. You know, it happens in inviting people into the things that you already do, because that's where the life change really happens. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. Uh, grew up with two parents who had planted a church in downtown Flint, and uh, the, the way that they planted a church was by. Um, by building relationships with the people on our street. And they were constantly bringing everybody over. And that, that's where I really first learned how to mentor people and how to, um, how to disciple people because that's, that's all they did. I was a lot younger than all of my siblings, so they didn't have babysitters for me, so they just took me along whenever they did it. Um, and uh, so I remember one time that we were going to visit this elderly couple. Her name was Harry and Louise Leonardson. They went to go see Harry because he had fallen ill. But my dad was also training a friend of his on how to go and, and meet with people. So he brought Mike along with him to show him, hey, this is how you visit someone. This is how you see how they're doing. This is how you go pray with them. You know, so this is, uh, it's something that I got to see every day. So we moved into the park about four years ago uh, in order to connect people here in, uh, in this trailer park in Pontiac to, uh, to our, our community in, at Kensington. And when I found out that the Orion campus would be moving right next door to this trailer park, uh, it was kind of like a light bulb moment. And I just kind of realized like, hey, this is something that I think God's been, wi he's been wiring me for since, uh, since I was a kid. When I found out that they were moving into the building, I immediately came and looked at this neighborhood because I knew it'd be a great way to connect our Orion campus with, um, with our, our Pontiac community. We do lots of things in here. We do tutoring during the school year. Um, during the summertime, we do uh, Bible studies for the kids in, in the park. And we bring um, a couple of kids from Kensington, uh, a couple of students, high school, middle school students, and uh, pair them up with some students in the neighborhood. And they eat together, they serve together, they pray together. They just have fun together and, and they get to know each other and see what it's like to impact your own neighborhood. 
Uh, we also do Easter egg hunt, we do Thanksgiving baskets, we do uh, Christmas gifts, and then assistance throughout the year. So people always know if they need anything that this is the place to come. I think one of the greatest impacts I've seen actually comes from a family down the street. I met him about three years ago and they were just getting ready to have a baby. And um, the dad was just laid off because of a physical impairment. And the mom came to me and asked if there was anything we could do to help. And I was like, yeah, yeah, what do you need? And they said, we need, we need diapers. I went to the, our, our community here at Kensington and put it on Facebook and sent out a couple of emails and said, hey, does anybody have diapers of this size? And by the end of the week, I had an entire van full that I brought to them. The family came to me a couple of days later with a list of about 30 things that they needed. And we, by the end of the summer, we were able to get everything that that family had asked for. And uh, at the end of it, the mom... At the end of it, the mom came up to me and uh, she cried and she said, our family's faith has been turned on for the first time. And now this family has gone from being a family that, that was served and that was helped. And they're a family who now helps here in the park and helps other people. And they do what they can to serve other people in our neighborhood. Um, and that's something that didn't happen in a program. That's something that just happened because I was willing to answer the door when she came knocking at like nine, nine in the evening. That's going second though. Awesome, Amber. That's cool. I'm glad to see you here today. When I first came here to serve, um, I, I came in thinking that I knew what I would be doing. <laughs> I very quickly learned that I really had no idea. One thing that I, I came in here doing that, that was right was I knew that it couldn't be done alone. So from the get-go, uh, my friends and I started bringing in some of our students from church to, to come and help out. One of those students was Luca Ewell. He started helping out with uh, tutoring. It was the first thing, first thing that he did, and, uh, and he came every single week. Now he's interning with us, but he's also he's running Vacation Bible School this year. So it's been cool to watch him get to know the families in the park and the kids in the park and start leading them. Uh, and they know him almost as well as they know me, which is pretty cool to see that happen. I've been mentored by Mike for four years now. Um, it started when um, one day he approached me and asked me if I wanted to help um, help in his house because after school he has um, a program where he helps kids with math and reading. And so that was the first time that I came over um, and started to really um, get to know this park and to, and to know Mike. I'd say the number one thing that I learned from Mike is just how to serve people with your entire being because um, he um, has opened up his house and he's just given so much back to this park. Um, and it's really inspired me to just really, if you're going to serve someone, to do it wholeheartedly. It started at 315. Mm -hmm. Every year, the K-Kids Summer Interns, they lead a vacation Bible school here in this park. And this year, I've been put in charge by Mike. And uh, we expect about 35 uh, to 40 kids this year. Our theme is God's Adventure. Um, and I'm super excited for me to lead people um, in a way that I have not before. And also to serve the kids of this park and really to show them God's love. I moved to this trailer park about four years ago, um, and really because I wanted to connect people to Jesus, and I wanted people to get some hope, and um, because I know that Jesus has changed my life, and I know He can change their life, and and what I found is the best way to do that is in bringing people along with you, you know, because um, mentoring and discipling it's not this crazy big strange thing. It it happens in the small stuff, you know. It happens in inviting people into the things that you already do because that's where the life change you know that's where the life change really happens you know it's a uh, pretty amazing is when michael got married he was realizing that he's going to move out and he didn't want to ask somebody to take it he wanted to see god bring somebody so he didn't go look for somebody he started praying he said god i need somebody that was scary God must want to say something to you right now. But yeah, he started praying. I need somebody that would come, and, and it can't be just one person. It needs to be done in a team, and I need, hope they can move in in July. And Brooke, who's our receptionist, if you see her during the week, came up to him one day and said, hey, I'm wondering how I could do something like you did in a, in a park somewhere someday. And he goes, uh, would you be interested in this one? She goes, well, you're there. He goes, I'm moving. He goes, do you, you have anybody to do it with you? Goes, yeah, my best friend Alyssa wants to do it as well. 
when are you available? She said, well, my lease ends in June. I'd be available in July. Boom, she's in there now. And so what Michael started has been passed on to another disciple who's making disciples. Two of the kids that have come out of that park are now in full-time ministry. One in camp ministry, one in youth ministry because of Michael's influence of pouring into people who pour into people. You know, that's what God has called you to do. Come on up. We have a, a group of interns at Kensington. You probably don't even know about this program, but every year we have a new intern group for the year, and they come in, and what are they? They're disciples who are going to take what we pass on to them and pass on to others, and they have various stories. We don't have time to hear every story. I hope you grab them sometime in the lobby and say, what's your story? But they're just going to say who they are and what area they work in real quick so you can see these are people receiving what we give, and they're going to pass it on. I'm Michaela Cantu, and I'm with Move Out. I'm Sydney Aiken, and I'm with 1829. I'm Ashley Turner, and I'm with Student Ministries. I'm Bree Baker, and I'm with Discipleship. I'm Alyssa Rathberg, and I'm with The Help Bank. I'm Arthur Harvey, and I'm Student Ministries. Arthur, you weren't here for service. Where were you, man? Uh, uh, I was in a grip. What? I was, you, you, have you ever heard of... Uh, I've heard of being in the grip. Yeah, so I uh, walked from here, from my house. You had to, to here. walk here today? I didn't have to, but I chose that to give some, give some God time. So oh, cool. it was about, it said it was a three hour walk, but it was really like an hour and a half. So, <laughs> so these are our interns right there. There you go. Hey, by the way, I know a guy who's got a truck. All right? <laughs> he might be able to help you out. Hey, give them a hand as they walk on off. Um, they're going to be around here. You're going to see them. They do amazing stuff, and um, it's just one way we pour in. Here's my question for you as we close the series with a song. My question for you is this. Who are your interns? Call them interns, call them disciples, call them anyone. Who is it you're pouring into who will take what you've given them and pour into others? I mean it. I hope you have a name. If you don't have a name today, I hope you have a name this year. At the end of this year, you look back and go, oh my goodness, God has done something in me, and I just... I didn't just keep it for me as a sponge. I became a funnel to be a disciple who makes disciples become who God created them to be. Go ahead and stand up. We're going to close this series with a song we've done all three weeks. It's just a song that says, Christ alone is enough. But Christ is never enough alone. He always does it in community. And so we get to end this series singing together in community. Let's sing this out together.
declare this with one voice. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back Christ is enough for me oh sing Christ is enough No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, oh, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Woo. All right. I'll tell you what. If you decided to follow Jesus and you try to do it alone, you'll turn back. You will, but if you do it in community, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. It's a dysfunctional community. It's all that. And if it doesn't work first time, try another. But if you do it in community, together, you'll keep, you'll keep going. And I mean it. So go out in that lobby right now. Find your squad and see where it goes. Last thing I'll say is this. The 1045 service, as you can tell, is packed. And I'm guessing getting in here was not a lot of fun. You know, you never want to have a, a, a traffic problem at church, but you really do. That means a lot of people are coming. So I'm just going to tell you, we have another service at, at noon, 1230 actually, right? What time is it? 1230. You're welcome to come to that one. Traffic's a lot better at 1230. All right. And then we'll watch the Lions game together and mourn. All right. God bless you. We got a prayer team up here front if you want to come pray. See you in the lobby. God bless you. See you next week for Why Bible. Bye-bye.